the Lord, the creator of the universe, your savior, your healer, the source of your joy, peace and freedom. You know, there was a, there was a lady in the Bible and we just know her as the lady at the well or they call her a Samaritan woman. There's no name that she had and um, that was given to her, her in scripture, but she had a name, but it wasn't given to, to us like, who this lady was. But we knew that this lady had a, a pretty bad past. And, and, and back in those days, I think, I think we're living in a world that's a lot more tolerant and, and allows a lot more room for mistakes. And, and, but she got married, I think, four or five times and, and ended up in divorce every time. And, and she met Jesus at a, at a well. And as she was talking to him, it was, a, it was probably a real hot summer day. And, and Jesus was by, herself, by himself. And he asked her, can you give me some water? And he began a conversation with her, not to judge her, because her society, her society judged her, the people around her judged her. And the reason she was probably getting water by herself in the middle of the hot day was because all the other ladies went in the morning and they excluded her, like, you can't come with us because we don't want to be associated with you. But Jesus wanted to be associated with her because Jesus wanted a relationship with her. That was the truth. Now, it was, it was that day was, the background of that day was interesting because um, they were working all day long. When I say they were working, God was coming here to work. And, and Jesus was here to work. And, and his work was to restore and heal humanity. So he would spend all day long, and, so, and at times he would spend all night long praying and connecting with God, praying, so that when he came down from that time of prayer, he would come and be full of love, full of hope, full of strength, full of wisdom, and then pour into people all day long. And that meant that he was feeding hungry people. Uh, there was a story in the Bible that there was at least 5,000 men and maybe 20,000 people combined with women and children. And Jesus saw something that they were hungry. And the disciples said, hey, send those people away. They're bothering us and send them away. They need to get food, send them away. Jesus said, no, no, let's feed them. And a miracle happened that moment where the, there was a little boy and he had five loaves and two fish. They brought him to Jesus. And then what Jesus did, he prayed over the, what looked like not enough. He multiplied it and began to feed people. And by the time it was done, it's, we know it's the miracle of God feeding, Jesus feeding 5,000. But every single person ate as much as they needed only because Jesus was aware people were hungry. And there'd be times that he'd go in the cities and with a real strong motive, I'm going to heal everybody. And there were people that were sick with cancer and, and pain and loss and, and not just physical healing, but emotional depression and anxiety. He would go in there and heal everybody because Jesus is concerned about people. And, and this lady at the well, she's sitting there and, and Jesus is talking to her and he's talking to her about her life. And then he says this to her, I am is, is talking to you. The savior is talking to you. And, and today, I, all I'm telling you we're going to be talking about an intense subject today, but this message is not to put anyone in a position where you're going to be judged and put down. It's let to let you know this, that God has a re wants a relationship with you, and he's brought you here to make you whole and complete. And you could go from relationship, like this lady, from relationship to relationship to relationship, from thing to thing to thing, but your answer of being whole is not going to be based on your sexuality. How many understand that? It doesn't, I mean, you could have as much sex with as many people as you want, with any gender that you want, but this is truth. You're still not going to be whole and complete, full of joy and peace. Some still going to be missing. And, and we're finding that we're living in a world that's utterly depressed. We're full of anxiety and fear. Our relationships are falling apart. We're more mentally ill than we ever have been. And this is what we're doing. But I don't want God. 
And that's like that lady at the ish, with the, that's at the well. Yeah, I, my relationships are falling apart. Nothing's working out. But Jesus, I don't want what you offer. And then Jesus said, look, if you only knew who I was, I'd give you water that you would never thirst again. What he was saying is, which you're thirsty, baby, and you're looking for your you're looking to quench your thirst with drugs, with with relationships, with community. You're trying to fit in somewhere. And said, that thirst that you have, you're gonna be thirsty for the rest of your life. But if you just come to me, I'll quench your thirst. I'll give you something that you've been looking for that will satisfy you. I'm the one that can quench your thirst. How many understand? God's the one that can quench your thirst. And we're going to be talking about, today we're going to be answering some questions. Is homosexuality a sin? We're going to be discussing that. Um, or is it, a, is it a sign of the last days? We're going to be answering that question today. Now, we're going to answer it because as believers, we should know. And it's probably the most loving thing we could do in this generation because no one wants, the church doesn't want to talk about it. Now, I, I, you know, I, I, I've talked to parents and, and they said, I really don't want to talk about this subject. And I know my, my son or daughter is struggling with homosexuality, but I don't want to lose them. And they'll say something like, I don't want to lose them and, and I want to let them know I love them, I support them. This is not about, I want you guys... This is about love, and this is, I want you, and this is about really supporting them because I, you might, and I want you to get this. If you discuss a tough, sub, a tough subject, if it's a tough subject, whatever it is, if your son's an alcoholic and you tell him, son, and you have a, you come to, to him and say, son, you're hurting yourself. You, you got to, right now you're, you're not just drinking. You're an alcoholic, man. You're driving. This is your third accident. I'm concerned about you. You're going to, I mean. You only do that because you love them. And what if they said, Mom, shut up. Get out of my face. I don't want nothing to do with you. And because of that, I'm walking out. Well, that could happen. But you love them enough to address them. And one day, maybe they'll recognize it. And you could have them for eternity. Come on. You could have them for eternity. They recognize what they're doing is wrong. So we're not just talking about this life. We're talking about eternal life. Now, I'm going to just just say this, if there is no eternal life and there is no God, it doesn't matter. If there's no right and wrong, none of this matters. But if there is right and wrong, this is the idea. If we're doing it wrong, there's consequences. And what I mean by that is it, it's a consequence on your being on your thinking, when you do wrong, it messes with your psyche, it messes with your relationships, because the reality of this is you can't do wrong and expect right results. It just, how I many that doesn't work? Right? But if, but if there is a right and wrong, then we need to discuss that because maybe you're doing life wrong and you're wondering, why am I so miserable? And you're doing it wrong. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm not here to mess up your life. I'm here to get you back on track, your emotions back on track. I want to make you whole and I want you with me for eternity. I want to set you free from the depression, the anxiety. I can make you a brand new person. Let's give the Lord a hand today because I really believe his presence is here. So glad you're here tonight. Now we're going to get into this. And um, as we get into it, everything's going to be based on what the Word of God says about this subject and what He says about every subject. And anytime I'm talking to anyone, I always go back to say, saying what the Bible says. And the reason I go back to that because I know it always works. Um, a doctor knows his medical manuals. He doesn't make up stuff as he goes. He looks, at the, he looks at the sickness and the symptoms, and he says, my diagnosis is this. And based on all the research and science, this is what you need to fix your problem. And, and what I've learned is that the word of God can fix your marriage problem. It can fix your emotional problems. It can fix your relationship problems. It can fix your financial problems. And it can really give you a true identity. So... We're going to dive into this subject today, and I want to let you know, if you don't have Jesus, this is what Jesus said. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to pray. Jesus said, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And this lady at the well, she was sitting there, and she was broken, hurting, and then Jesus told her, I am the Savior. I'm the one that can make you whole. I'm going to make you, I, can, I can give you what you're looking for. 
And the scripture says that she believed. And when, when she went back to her town that rejected her and they saw her face, they said, what happened to you? And she goes, I met him. He knew everything about me. He didn't judge me, but he did save me. He made me whole, have joy and peace I've never experienced. You got to check this out. And the whole village said they came and they said, we believe by the change we saw in her. But now we believe because we've heard it from you. And today you could have a relationship with God today. And I'm telling you, whatever you're looking for, you could find in that relationship with God. Okay. So we're going to pray. But Jesus says, the thief comes to kill sinister, but I've come. This is what Jesus came to do. What did Jesus come to do? Did he come to judge me? No. Scripture says he didn't come to judge. Well, what did he come to do? To give you life in abundance. The, another version says, I've come to give you a rich and satisfying life. What you're looking for is found in one name. Come on. You could try whatever. What's the name that you're going to every single day? That you're trying to find your identity in. You're trying to find your purpose in. You're trying to find your satisfaction. And what is that you're going to? Because weed can't make you whole. Come on. Crack can't make you whole. Come on. You could be a player. That's not going to make you whole. You could win the lotto. That's not going to make you. might make you happy for a minute. But it's not going to make you whole. Right? You could buy things. It's not going to make you whole. You could get a degree. It's not going to make you whole. But if you call upon the name of the Lord, just like that lady at the well, she believed. She left with a different life, a full, satisfying life. Try it out. Father, we just thank you, Lord. As we dive into the subject, we ask you, Lord, to direct us. Holy Spirit, move. You're the only one that can save anybody. Convict us of our sin that makes us, and all that means is make us realize that we're wrong and we're doing things wrong. And you're the only one that can save us and make make us whole and cause us even to repent. Father, I pray for every single person here, those that are depressed, hurting, broken, feel rejected and judged. In the name of Jesus, we come against that. In the name of Jesus. And I just pray that everyone here will feel your love, know that you're speaking to them, that you care for them, that you love them, and you want to have a relationship with them, and you paid the price to set them free, that you were punished for our sins so we could have eternal life. Make us realize of your goodness, your goodness today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right. We're talking about the end times. And is there, I want to see the end time calendar up there. And I just want to look at it real quick so we'll find out where we're at. End time signs. Okay. This is right at the beginning is the current church age. That's where we're at today. Uh, This is, this, the current church age is defined as the time after Jesus came because he did come. We're in 2022. It's 2,022 years after Jesus came. He lived, he died, resurrected, and he went to the Father. And when he went, he ascended, and the, the disciples, his disciples were looking at him descending into heaven, and they just were fixed on Jesus, and they kept looking, looking until he disappeared. And then an angel came to him, to them, and said, what are you looking at? And, and, and they said, the same way you saw him go, he's coming back. So there was a promise that Jesus went, and there was a promise that he was coming back. Before Jesus came, it was prophesied he would come. And that's why back in the days that when Jesus lived, there was a lot of talk about the Messiah, the Savior of the world coming. And they knew it was prophesied, and the people of the day knew prophetically. They studied the scripture, and they knew Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah of the world was coming. He did come. He did come, and then t- he split time in half. And now we're, we counted up from one all the way to 2022. And we're 2,022 years after Jesus came, died, and resurrected from the dead. And it's called the church age. This is a time that we're speaking, preaching the Bible, the good news that we can be saved, that we can be forgiven, that we can be set free and receive the free gift of eternal life. That means this is a time of mercy, this time of grace. It's also a time of warning. That means make sure that you're not so caught up in this world that you're not thinking about eternity. There's a scripture that says, what is the profit of man or a woman 
to gain everything this world that has to offer. And at the end, you got it all wrong and you lost your soul as a result. And your life is limited and this is a reality. And you know it. I'm not saying anything that's crazy. One day your life will end. And once, once your life ends, the question is, will you meet up with the creator of the universe? And if you are, the Bible says after death is judgment. You're going to give accountable Accountability, you're gonna give account, you're gonna be accountable to the thoughts, the things that you did, and also what you did with messages like this, because God uses his word to transform people's lives. Words can change your life. How many understand words can change your life? And God's word, if you receive it and understand it, there's a good news message that can save you, forgive you, and give you life after death. It's called eternal life. But not only eternal life, it can give you a quality of life today. And that's why this house is full, and that's why thousands of people are coming to Jesus, and that's why the Bible is a best-selling book in the world, because it has the answers to today's problems. Your government cannot solve your problem. Your money cannot solve your problem. Your husband can't solve your problem. Your kids getting right can't solve your problem. But there's a God that created you, and if you get reconnected to him, you'll be fruitful again. Okay, so let's talk about that. So the church age is the time Jesus resurrects. He, 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 he's now given his time. He promised to come back. Now the rapture hasn't happened yet. And, and that's when Jesus comes back. Uh, I'm not going to confuse anybody, but the rapture is not necessarily the second coming of Christ. The rapture is when Jesus comes back for his church. It's the beginning of... Right after the rapture, where's the rapture? Jesus Christ is coming back. And those that are believers, he came back today. Those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ that are saved, you'll leave this earth, the Bible says. You'll be transformed in the twinkle of an eye. That means you'll be caught up in the air with the Lord to live with him forever and ever. And that'll be your last day on this earth the way it is. Those that aren't ready will be left behind. And they'll begin a seven-year tribulation that we'll go into later on in this series, seven-year tribulation. But right now, we got some time. And I, the question we're, run, we're asking ourselves, are we at the end of the world? It, are we close to the rapture? That's the question we're asking. And the disciples asked that question. But not only did the disciples ask that question, there were some religious leaders of the day that also asked that question. So today we'll answer two questions. Question number one, is the rise of homosexuality a sign of the last days? And this is, what I, this is what's happening right now. There definitely is a rise in homosexuality. The percent of U.S. adults who identify as something other than heterosexual has doubled over the last 10 years. From 3.5% in 2012 to 7.1% according to Gallup, a Gallup poll released Thursday. Bisexuals make up 4% of all U.S. adults, bisexual, of homosexual adults. Bisexuality is the most common identifier used among the LGBTQ Americans, which is in line with the Gallup report released last year. More than half of the LGBTQ Americans at 57% are bisexual. So that means that right now there's 7% in America that, that, that identify themselves as LGBTQ and 4% of them, which is a majority, are not just homosexual. What they're saying is we're bisexual, bisexual. And that means I will have sex with men and women. Okay, so that points to something that's interesting, that it points to desire and it, it points to passion and it's saying this, I don't care who satisfies me as long as I'm sexually satisfied. We got to think about that. Now, Gallup, found, Gallup also found that the increase is due to, um, to high LGBT self-identification, particularly as bisexual among generations. Gallup found that the, there's an increase due to high LGBT self-identification, particularly as bisexual among the Generation Z adults who are 18 to 25 years old. Uh, more than one in five or 21% of Generation Z adults 
identify as LGBTQ. So we're finding out that the younger generation, a bigger percentage, are actually identified. There's a rise, and the younger the group, the higher the percentage. Okay, so we're gonna discuss like why? Why would the younger group have a higher percentage? Good question, and we have to ask those questions. Okay, um, that's almost double the portion of millennials who are 26 to 41. They're at 10 percent. So. The Generation Z is at 21% identifying as LGBTQ, and millennials are at 10%. And as we get older, Generation X, 42 to 57, is only 4%, less than 3% of baby boomers. And 58 to 76 identifies LGBTQ compared as point, um, 0.8%. Tradition, uh, traditionalists who are 77 or older. So th it's a, there is a trend. The older you get, the less you identify with being, a, uh, uh, being part of the LGBTQ community. Okay, so is there a rise? There is definitely a rise, especially in Generation Z. Question number two, is homosexuality a sin? So we're going to answer those two questions. The rise of homosexuality, definitely a rise in the Latin Def, that definitely does arise. And the question number two is homosexuality a sin? Um, if there, if it is, it is a sin. Now, that's a big question. It is important to know what a sin is because a sin comes with consequences. So if, if it's not a sin, it really doesn't matter. There's no consequences. But if it is a sin, whether you realize it or not, say, I don't call it a sin. If God calls it a sin, then it comes with consequences. I remember one day I was standing before a judge. And I, I just started driving. And, and I, I got a ticket. And this was a ticket. I went through a stop sign. Um, and I didn't stop all the way. I stopped though. So when I went before the judge, I go, I got this. I did stop. Kind of. And I remember standing before the judge. He goes, innocent or guilty? I go, not really guilty. He goes, explain yourself, young man. I go, well, I stopped. I looked both ways like I was walking. I saw there was nobody there, and I proceeded to go. You look both ways, and you go. My mom taught me that. He goes, no, you know what that's called, son? I go, what? He goes, the California stop. You didn't stop all the way. You didn't stop. You're supposed to stop. And your car, after all the inertia is gone, you stopped. The car's no longer rocking. You stopped. And then you could proceed forward. I go, but I didn't know that. Can you excuse me? And this is what the judge says. Ignorance is no excuse for the law. So I was saying it's not a sin. I was saying I didn't break the law. I was ignorant of breaking the law, but I still was guilty, and I still had a consequence. That's a question. In Romans 6.23, it says this, for the wages of sin is death. Now, this is an absolute statement, and sin produces death every single time. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. So the scripture is identifying you could have death or you could have eternal life. You could have death in this life or you could have eternal life. You could have the quality of life that I'm offering you or you could have the death life that you're experiencing today. Now the word sin just means this. The wage of sin is, it means wrong. It means the wrong path. So when we're sinning, we're on the wrong path. Have you ever seen someone on the wrong path? And when they're on the wrong path, you can predict, man, these person's headed for trouble. Because they're on the wrong path. I've seen young people start off right and end up really, really wrong. I've seen young girls that had a bright future hook up with the wrong guy. Have you ever seen that? Say, oh, Lord. And mom could see it. A blind man could see it. But the one that's involved in the sin can't see it because sin is very deceptive. It's very blinding. And we get caught up in the pleasure of the sin. And the sin makes us blind to the consequences. 
We want to put our head in the sand and say, wait, my, it's going to work out. It's not going to work out. You're on the wrong path. It means the wrong path. It means a violation of God's commands and, and moral principles. It just means transgression. And God, God has defined what sin is. I didn't define it. God's defined it. And what he's saying, when you break those laws of life that I've set, the absolute right and wrongs that I've set, this is the result. It will produce death. The word death is a Greek word, thanatos, and it means separation from God. What does it produce? We're in a society that we're more separated from God. As a matter of fact, we don't want nothing to do with God. We're trying to take God out of government. We're trying to take God out of school. We're trying to take God out of our conversations. As a matter of fact, they tell you there's two things you shouldn't talk about, and one of them is politics, and the other one is religion. Because those are things that get people really riled up. We want to eliminate. We are in war right now. And this is what there's, I'm going to tell you this. There's a real spiritual attack to remove the fingerprints of God on this earth because people want to live a life of sin without any consequences. And what I want to do is do wrong, and I don't want anybody to tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. And we might even say this, don't preach to me. I'm not preaching to you. I love you. I'm just telling you the truth because I want you to get back on track so you can start experiencing the life you were created to live. <laughs> Separation for God. The word death means misery of the soul that begins on earth but continues for eternity in hell. Now, this is what happens. The more we're separated from God, the unhappier we are the more miserable we are emotionally. Right now, if you're in this room and you've been suffering from depression, you've been suffering from anxiety, you've been suffering from torment, bad dreams, and you're struggling with your, you're struggling with your self-worth and rejection, the re, that's a result of being separated from truth and separated from God. And God is saying, it hurts me to see you in this miserable state because I did not create you to live in addiction, to live in depression, to be suicidal. I did not live, make you to live in fear and anxiety and be tormented and angry. I created you to have a full life. And if you'll just get reconnected with me, your quality of life will be restored. Someone's joy is waiting for a connection tonight with the creator of the universe. He knows how to make you happy and he can set you free. Sin always ends in misery. Wow. And at the end, it can end up in hell. Also, death means the loss of life concentrated to God and his blessings on earth and followed by eternal torment in the lake of fire for eternity. We're talking about a quality of life that's lost here on this earth. We're also talking about eternal consequences. The wage of sin is death. There's no such thing as doing it wrong, breaking the law, and there's no consequences. This week, I got a letter in the mail. And this was the letter. I got a ticket from Irvine. And it's in my name. Someone was driving in a carpool lane. And it wasn't me. It was one of my daughters. One of their cars were in my name. And there's a fine to pay. And there's no way around. That either you pay it or it starts doubling on you. I wasn't there, but the cameras got her. They got the license plate. And the idea is I could drive in a carpool lane, I could do whatever I want, I could steal, I could break God's law, I could commit adultery, I could live however I want, and, and thinking this, there will not be consequences. But we're living in a world full of death. See, our society's def definition of right and wrong, and this is just a quick review, comes from themselves. Now, 
I want to just talk about right and wrong for a second here because if we don't have a foundation of what's determined right and wrong and what's sin and what's not, we could just go around in a circle because, because your opinion and society's opinions and textbooks are as good as my opinion. It doesn't really matter. This is not about opinion. This is about right and wrong. Is there absolutely right or wrong? And if you don't know, this is what I'm saying. It, where are you getting your truth from? Where are you getting your morality from? If, if you have no absolute place, you're getting it from where, this idea, where are you getting it from? Now, society's definition of right or wrong comes from society or from us. So society gets their right and wrong from society. That means you get your right and wrong from your group, from your friends, or from yourself. That means there's no absolute right or wrong. It all depends how you see it. Understand, this is secular humanism, relativism, and it's being taught in the universities today. It's not true, but it's being taught like this is true. It's relativism. What's relativism? It's the belief that what is right and wrong is determined by culture or individual beliefs, and there are no universal laws. Now, this is what it's saying. And make it simple like this. If I, I want you to get this. If I believe that rape is not wrong, that's up to me. I choose it. Eventually, I'm just telling you that's how I feel. I don't think it's wrong. I think God created women and I feel like I should have them. Women are a gift of the Lord and I just think I should have that. Right and wrong determined by society is a sliding scale because it's never the same today or tomorrow because as we're changing our lives, this is what happens. As we're becoming more sinful, this is what we want to do. We want to make laws that reflect us, not God. I, I already feel like I'm guilty, but if we could make it law that what I'm doing is not wrong, maybe I could justify it, legalize it, and make myself, I want you to get this, you can legalize wrong, it's still wrong. And it still has consequences. So relativists believe that right and wrong is determined by culture. Now, as believers, we get our definition of right and wrong. As believers, we get our definition of right and wrong, I'm going to say it again, from the word of God. Where do we get our definition of right and wrong? It's really the oldest historical book in the world. All other literary works, the foundation is the word. I was listening to a, a philosopher of the day, and he was saying this, that the Bible, and he's not a Christian, but he was saying the Bible is absolute truth. He goes, it's beyond truth. He goes, how, how you know something's truth is by how, if it's a foundational literary work. And he was saying literally all other literature eventually started with the Bible as its foundation. Second Timothy, that's why cultures are created, are created by right and wrong and God is an intrinsic definer of morality. We see that in 2 Timothy 3.16 3, it says all scripture, say it with me, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So the Bible is a mirror and it shows us what's right and wrong. So that means I could feel like that's not wrong and then I look at all oh, it's wrong. I feel that's, that's right. He goes, no, that's wrong. I feel that's wrong. He goes, no, that's right. So the word of God is where we as believers, I want you to get this, all scripture comes from God and every we get our morality from the word of God. If you're a believer, you're an absolutist. That means you believe that, that says, absolutists believe this, that something, when something is wrong, it is always wrong. We believe that there are many cultural norms endorsed by society, but it doesn't make these acts moral. 
and there are absolute rights and wrongs, whether we agree with them or not. So we believe that our, our truth, our morality comes from the word of God. Now, let's talk about the signs of the last days. Now, one sign number seven said this, that in the last days, it would be like the days of Lot and Sodom. Now, this is a historical city that no longer exists. It did exist at one time. Some Pharisees or religious leaders of the day came to Jesus. He said, when will your kingdom come? When will you come? When will you establish your kingdom on earth? And Jesus began to answer that. In Luke 17, 20, it says, some of the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will your kingdom come? Religious leaders, that they asked the question, when will the end come? Jesus said, it would be like the days of Sodom. In Luke 17, 28, Jesus answers, it will be the same as during the days, the time of Lot, when God destroyed Sodom. Verse 34, that night, this is what he's describing the end, that night when I come back, that night two people will be asleep in one bed, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill, one will be taken, the other one left. Verse 37, where... Where will this happen, Lord, the disciples asked Jesus. And Jesus replied, just as the gathering of vultures shows that there is a carcass nearby, so these signs will indicate that the end is near. Now, if you, vultures, have you ever seen vultures? I've seen them only on TV. Are there any vultures around here? I don't know if I've seen any vultures around here. But I've seen them on TV. But, but the idea is, if there's vultures circling, there's something dead around it. And, and what he's saying is, when you start seeing the days like Noah or the days like Sodom, understand it's a sign the vultures are circling. It's a sign that death is there, but it's also a sign for us that Jesus is coming soon. So now, let's develop this. How was it? In Lot's day and Sodom's day. How was it? Number one, the people were unaware that judgment was coming. Total lack of awareness of God, eternal life, eternal consequence for evil behavior. In Luke 17, 30, yes, it will be business as usual. Right up to the day when the son of man is revealed. Remember what happened to Lot's wife. Now, if you know the story of Lot's wife, God's, God went in with some angels and he told Abraham, I'm going to destroy this city of Sodom because of its wickedness. Uh, and, and Lot asked, can I at least bring my cousin out of there, Lot? And, and, and God said, okay, get him out and his family. But then when he told them, when you're leaving the, the city of Sodom, don't look back because if you look back, you're going to die. So they all took off and while rain, fire, sulfur is landing on Sodom and destroying it, everyone's tempted to look back, but Lot's wife does look back. And the scripture says she turned into a pillar of salt. So let's describe, see what, what he says. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. And if you let your life go, you will save it. And the reason she was looking back is because she liked the lifestyle. She liked her home, and she was living in a very immoral society, but she was tempted to look back because she was saying, man, I feel like I'm leaving my life behind. And God was saying, no, I'm giving you a new life. Don't look back to the old life. And God is saying, if you're willing to lose, the life that you have right now, I'll give you the full life that you've been looking for your whole life. If you're willing to lose and repent of the wrong you've done, I'll save you. I'll make you whole. I'll set you free. And I'll give you eternal life. Now, the people were unaware that judgment was coming. It was just business as usual. We're living in a day like that. We're just so busy going Right. I mean, the freeways are crazy. There are more people on the, in the, on the freeways than ever. I don't even know how it's happening. 
restaurants. You can't even get into a half decent restaurant today. Everybody's going out and eat. I don't even know how we're doing that. I mean, isn't it, isn't it like inflation is way high and every everything costs so much? I went the other day, me and Lisa, for just Chinese food, a Panda Inn. And after I got that bill, I was saying, excuse me. I was offended. I was just really offended. I go, Lisa, we got to cook at home. So I, I ordered HelloFresh. I go, we're cooking at home. That bill was $102 for me and Lisa. I go, we got to repent of that. No, but we're living in a world that the stock market's going up and down. We're busy going back and to and fro. We're driving. We're trading. We're buying houses. We're, we're buying cars. We're, we're going. We're, we're trading relationships. We're, we're getting involved in all kinds of sins and all kinds of stuff. And God is saying, business as usual. That's exactly how it was in the days of Sodom. And they didn't know that judgment was right around the corner. And all I'm letting you know that you never know when your life is going to end and you never know when Jesus Christ is coming back. Don't be like the people of Sodom that were unaware because the signs are here. Now understand this. There's a devil that wants to deceive you. And while we're speaking, there's only two things to do. Open up your heart and understand or say, I'm tuning, tuning this out. And the only reason you will tune it out is because you're not opening your mind. And also, number two, is you want to look back at your life and you're not willing to lose it. And if you're not willing to lose it, I guarantee you this, you're going to lose it. Number two, how was it in the days of Sodom, of Sodom a lot of Sodom's day? The people had become great sinners. There was no remorse or awareness of sin. The wicked lifestyle had become part of the culture. In Genesis 13, 13, it says, Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. So we saw two things. They were unaware that judgment was coming. They were unaware that there were consequences on the horizon. And, and they, were they were great sinners. I mean, they weren't just sinning. They were sinning with no remorse. They were, sin, they were practicing it, and they were becoming really good at it. What were the two major sins? They were great sinners. What were the two major sins of Sodom? The Bible says it will be like the days of Lot and Sodom. Number one, it was pride. Ezekiel 16, 49, it says this, your sister Sodom and her daughters were proud. What was their sin? Pride. You know, pride is, pride is the sin that actually got Satan kicked out of heaven. He was basically saying, I don't need God. I'll just raise my throne above God's. I'll be God. And you're thinking, are we doing that today? Well, pride will have you doing that. It'll have you saying the same thing. I don't need God. I'll be God. And I'll make up my own commandments and I'll make them a God that matches up with my lifestyle. So they were prideful. Look what it says. It says, um, it says they were proud. They had too much, they had too much to eat, too much time on their hands. They did not help the poor, helpless, helpless people. They were just so absorbed in their lives. They weren't thinking about nobody else. In, in verse 50, Sodom and her daughters became too proud and began to do terrible things in front of me, so I punished them. They became so proud that they were arrogant in the wrong they were doing. As a matter of fact, they were proud of the terrible things they were doing. Isn't it interesting, is it interesting that the homosexual community, this is just an observation, their mission or their flag is pride. It would be like the days of Sodom and they would be under a flag of pride. Number two, sexual morality and homosexuality. In Genesis 19, 4, 5, now, this is what happened, this is really what happened when, when angels came in to rescue Lot. And they came in 
in the form of men. They're, uh, they're messengers of God, and they came into the city. And when they came into the city, Lot saw them in the city square. And he told them, hey, guys, come into my house. Don't stay out there all night. It's not safe. It's a bad hood. I don't recommend you staying out there in this hood. Out there, I mean, it's very dangerous. And they just said, no, we got it. And, and, and they did have it. They were angels. And, but he insisted, no, 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 no. I cannot allow you in my city as a stranger to sit out there in this bad hood. If anything happens to you and you get robbed or something happens, I just would take personal responsibility. Please just come in. They did. Now, the men of the city knew that these men were there. When a society is driven by lust and pleasure, a hedonistic society, they just don't see men. They see opportunities to pick up on somebody for pleasure. Hmm. Look what it says. In Deuteronomy, in Genesis 19, 4, it says, But before they retired for the night, all, all the men, say it with me, all the men, of Sodom. It wasn't just a few men. It was like the society became, they all thought the same. But this is what they were thinking of Sodom. Young and old, generation Z, X, and X, Y, Z, came from all over the city and surrounded the house. So when these angels were in the house, they surrounded the house. I don't know what happened in that hood, but they were talking. There's some fresh meat in Sodom. Look what they said. So they shouted to Lot, where are the men who came to spend the night with you? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. Whoa. So they were just like thirsty. Now understand, I'm reading you history. I'm just reading history. So we see when the days are like Sodom, he goes, the, the vultures are flying. It's a sign I'm coming. It's just like that today. The vultures are flying. The signs are here. There's a rise in this type of thinking. Let us have sex with them. In Jude 1, 7, it says, and don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah. This describes their lifestyle and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. Now understand this, sexual morality and sexual perversion will be judged if it's not repented of. Sexual morality and sexual perversion. Now, sexual morality falls under all sex out of marriage. Homosexuality, adultery, fornication is all the same group. It falls under sexual immorality. What are we talking about? The only sex that God condones is a sex between a husband and a wife in a committed relationship of marriage. Now, understand this. Whether you believe that or not, I'm going to tell you why it makes sense. And under, understand, it makes sense. It's logical. If we did that, we'd have a healthier society, I guarantee you. Why would it be a healthier society? This is why it would be a healthier society. Because men and women wouldn't have sex unless they were committed to each other for life. Now, if you have sex and you're committed to each other for life and you have a child, you have two parents that are committed to each other for life that could raise a child for the rest of their lives. That's a good thing. We wouldn't have so many abortions that we do today. You know, we, the reason we have so many abortions in the world today is because we're having sex outside of marriage. And now there's a consequence of having sex out of marriage. And now we're saying, okay, I'm having sex out of marriage. So what I want to do, and I, what I want to do is kill the consequence. The other day, I was at Best Buy. And I was at Best Buy because today it's really difficult to get appliances. I don't know if you know that. 
So in order, I, I'm redoing my kitchen. In order to get appliances, you almost have to order them six months in advance. So I order my appliances in July. My kitchen's done, and now we're bringing the appliances in. So I call Best Buy, and you have to give them all your money up front to get the appliances. So I order them. I pay for them. I go, bring my appliances. And they said, what appliances? I go, no, you didn't. <laughs> I go, I know you didn't. Say that, right? They said, we canceled your order, sent everything back, and sold it. Because we were going to deliver it on a day and you couldn't, because your kitchen wasn't done, you cancel the delivery and we cancel your appliances. I go, okay. So I drove down there. I'm still Christian, but I go down there. I'm still Christian, but I go down there. So when I go down there, I, I say, okay, okay. They go, okay, we can reorder everything. I go, I know you can but my kitchen is done now, and I want my stuff as soon as possible. So I need you to prioritize my kitchen. So and this is what he, what he did was he goes, okay. This, so he adds everything up, reorders everything. He goes, I'm going to get stuff from all over, and we're going to see if we can get it in like in a month period of time and reorganize everything, put you on top, top of the list. But he was charging me $10,000 more. So I go, you're going to charge me more for your mistake? And you know what I said? And I'm gonna get, this is as simple as it gets. I go, do you know what happens when, listen to what I'm saying, when you mess up and you make someone else pay for your mess up? He goes, what? You keep on doing it. So anytime you mess up and you have someone else pay for your consequences, this is a lesson you learn. I got away with it, I'll keep on doing it. We're living in a world that we want everybody to pay for our mistakes. And that's what abortion is all about, is that I am doing my thing, and I don't want to pay the consequences, so you, baby, are going to pay it. I eventually was there for two hours, and we got it down to the same price. Right? Praise the Lord. Come on. The reason, why are we covering this? Because we're living in that type of society. Man, we're, we're, man, we're running out of time again. Are you, guys, are you guys interested in this? It's interesting. But look at this. It says, so look at this. And Judah says, and don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. They're, they're, they're filled with sexual morality and sexual perversion. Now, I want to look up the word perversion, and I, I'm not biased, so I didn't look it up in some biblical dictionary. I looked it up in a regular Google dictionary. <laughs> Google it. You'll find this definition. And this is what perversion, they define perversion as. Any of various means of obtaining sexual gratification that is unnatural and abnormal. To lead astray morally, to turn from right the right course, to turn to an improper use. To misapply, to bring to a less excellent state, to change to what is unnatural or abnormal. So sexual perversion is switching from the normal to the abnormal. Normal. God has created man and woman, and he created them to be one, and then he gave them a command. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. God created sex, and sex is good. Sex is good in the parameters that God created it in. It's safe. It produces healthy families. And it's actually reprodu reproductive. When something is used properly, it reproduces. When something is not used properly, it can't reproduce because we're using it in a way it can't be, it shouldn't be used. I'm going to get that. Man still has sperm. Women still have eggs. 
But when man and men get together, it's sperm with sperm. Well, pastor, why, why are we all these biology? I'm just teaching some basic biology. <laughs> and when women get together, it's egg with egg. So therefore, it cannot reproduce because it's the wrong use. It's the wrong version. So we know how something is wrong or abnormal when it no longer works. It's the wrong application. God will never command you to do something you can't do. Oh, man, we got to. Oh, Lord. I, I'm just beginning this subject. I can't keep on going because we're going to have to cover part two next week. How many want a little more time to develop this? We're going to go to part two. Come on, you're learning some stuff today. We're just kind of beginning the process. I, I will end it with this. I, I shared this story before. I, I, I feel like I'm really called to reach a homosexual community. And, and I run into homosexuals all the time. And, and, and when I say I run into them, I run into them in conversation. And my feeling is I just absolutely love them. I feel like there's a river flowing out of me. A, a river of love is flowing out of me as, we're, as we begin the conversation. Because there's a lot of hurt and pain and rejection. And I could feel it. And, and I, I was talking as we're remodeling our house. I go to Palm Springs a whole bunch. And, and a lot of the designers are homosexuals. As a matter of fact, one of the guys that de designed my kitchen is homosexual, and I love him. And he absolutely loves me. <laughs> he, uh, he, not, he don't love me that way, guys. <laughs> you guys are crazy. He's not thinking I'm one of those angels. I mean, you guys. No, he absolutely loves me. No, but he loves me as a man of God. And I shared my faith with him and I shared my testimony. He came over to my house and I talked to him about God. And he brags about me everywhere to all his friends. He goes, I know this guy. Now, he's not saying he's bragging because, man, there's a good-looking pastor. That's not what he's saying. What he brags is about my lifestyle. And I told him what we do as a church, how we have men's homes, women's homes. We're rescuing people off the streets and loving every single person that we could love. We have a women's home for women and children. If they're on the streets and they need a place to stay, we rescue them. And, and he goes, man, he goes, I am so impressed with your lifestyle and the way you live. And it has so much meaning. I wish I could have that lifestyle. And I share my faith with them all the time. And the owner of that company actually gave his life to the Lord probably around two months ago as I began to share my faith with him. And he has a new life. His wife, it's just amazing. He's so happy sharing his faith. And so that's happening. And, and, and as I was um, prior three, four months ago, I, I was buying some furniture and I, and I came in, into the store and, and one of the guys came up to me and and he's, he's in Palm Springs, and he's, one of, he's part of the homosexual community. And he came up to me, and he, and, and he doesn't know who I am. I don't know who he is. And he comes up to me. He goes, how you doing? I go, very good. He goes, where are you from? Where are you coming from? I go, San Bernardino. He goes, San Bernardino, how interesting. He goes, my sister is from San Bernardino, and she's one of those pastors, preachers, teachers, her and her husband. I don't even know what they are. And I go, oh, really? He goes, and, and I go, well, I'm one of those people too. <laughs> he goes, oh, okay. And he just hits me between the eyes and he says, he goes, you know that a homosexual cannot be converted. You know that because there was a ministry called Exodus and they tried to convert homosexuals and they're realizing that to convert a homosexual is impossible because they're born that way. And we're going to get into that next week. Are homosexuals born that way? And I'm going to give you the answer. You'll be surprised what I tell you. Okay. It's going to be good. You don't want to miss it. I'm telling you. I'm going to, you're going to get, we're, going to find, we're going to find out how, we're going to find out the four ways someone becomes a homosexual. 
And you might be saying, today, it's not becoming, I was born that way. And that's one of the ways. We'll talk about that. Just being born. We'll talk about that um, next week. But, but, and then I talked to him and I told him, I told him, I go, you know how I look at homosexuality? He goes, how do you look at it? I go, well, I just look at it as lust. He goes, and I, I lust. I got an issue with lust. And thank God, God helps me through it. But if it was up to me, I would, I'd have more than one wife. I told him just like that. As a guy, I could sleep with more than one girl. I could watch all kinds of porn all day long. And no matter how much I gave into it, it wouldn't satisfy me. I go, but you know the difference between me and you? I look at lust as a sin, and I ask God to help me to forgive me and set me free and help me overcome it. And I go, you look at your lust as your identity. I go, so the difference between me and you is no difference. You're lusting, I'm lusting. You're, you're lusting after men, I'm lusting after women. But the idea here is sexual morality is sexual morality. What you need to do is start defining it the way I define it. It's a sin. And if it's a sin and you admit it's a sin, you could be forgiven. You could be set free. And God could give you new desires and make you whole and make you complete. And I go, now let me tell you this. I go, let me ask you this. I go, I go, be honest with me. I go, be honest with me. We're in the showroom floor. I go, be honest with me. I go, right now, are you satisfied? Are you, because I know this, that without God, there's an emptiness in you. And it doesn't matter who you're with, how many times you're with them, there's something missing in your life. I go, are you satisfied or are you feeling empty? He goes, to be honest with you, I'm empty. I'm married. I'm not satisfied with my, my husband. I feel depressed. I don't know who I am. I go, exactly. He goes, can we just stop this conversation? I go, we can. You started it. So I just said, I came here for furniture, bro. You're opening up all these can of worms. I just want furniture, but I love you, so I'm talking with you. But if you want to stop the conversation, we can stop it right now, homie. No. <laughs> but you know what he did? He, he went around everybody and got back right to me. He started telling me all of his problems. I started loving him. I go, man, I'm going to be praying for you. He goes, I'm telling you, there's a life that you've been looking for. You're, there's only one identity that will satisfy you. And the Bible says you were once a people with no identity. He goes, but then you became children of God. And when you become a child of God, that's all God wants from you. He just wants to be your father and he wants you to be a son. And if you allow that to happen, you'll finally be complete and you could have a new life. And by the time we're done... He stopped the conversation again. He goes, please stop. I go, I'm not starting. You came to me. I'm here for furniture. <laughs> he got to me one more time. And he started talking because the love that I had, what I had, he knew I got to get some of that. And by the time I left that, that, that store, he told me, he goes, look, I just want to let you know something. Thank you for the conversation. It changed my life. You know what happened next? I went down there three, four months later. So maybe this was six months ago. I went three months later. And when I got there, he looked at me. He goes, are you that preacher? He goes, yeah. He goes, you know what? I'm making some moves in the right direction. He goes, I just joined a biblical AA group. He goes, and they're dealing with my other issue as well. He goes, and I'm headed towards, uh, uh, I'm headed towards uh, coming out of this lifestyle. All I'm letting you know that if you're struggling tonight, please don't reject the love and and the wholeness that God has given you. Be like the lady at the issue of blood. Is, uh, at the, I mean, the lady with at the well says, "I'm missing something. I need some help." And if that's you, I got good news for you. God is not here to judge you. This whole story and everything we're covering about the days are going to be like the days of Noah was just describing the last days. It will be like that. And we're part of a society that participates in it. We think that way. We're getting our wrong and right from ourselves. And we're finding the more we're defining right and wrong, the more miserable, hurt, dysfunctional we are. And we're empty. 
and you could keep on going your way and you're going to find it's only going to end in the same dead end. Death, misery, pain, emptiness, and separation from even the good things you used to have. And you're going to find your life going in a downward spiral. And you're saying, what's missing? And all I'm telling you, God is not here to judge you. He's here to make you whole. And if you just open up your heart and just use the little faith that you have, you can receive forgiveness, receive eternal life, and God can make you new. He can make you new and complete. Let's all stand up. Let's give the Lord a big hand. How many received something from God today? Okay. Next week is part two. And we're going to be covering what specifically does the Bible say about homosexuality. And we're also going to cover how, why is there an increase in homosexuality? What, what's actually causing that? We're going to find that out as well. And um, you really want to come because we need to be equipped. If we don't talk about this, no one else is going to talk about it. And I'm going to tell you this, God loves you and we do too. And that's why we're talking about it. I'd rather someone be upset with me for a little portion of time and be with me for eternity. Let me try. Because I tell you that, I'm going to tell you this. That the person that really loves you is not the one that goes along with you. Is the one that tells you the truth. How many understand? They're, they're the ones that really love you. Now, if you have children that are, that are involved in this lifestyle, we're not here to judge them, put them down, put the ramp scripture down their throat. But we're going to let them know, first of all, that you love them. Let's make sure they get that message. You absolutely love them. But also we're going to give them a message that there's a fullness of life that you're looking for that can only be found in Jesus. And whoever calls upon that name can be forgiven, can be set free, have eternal life. A miracle can happen today. You could become a brand new person. If you just say yes to what's knocking, who, who's knocking on your door. Love is knocking on your heart's door. Wholeness is knocking on your heart's door. Acceptance is knocking on your heart's door. Freedom is knocking on your heart's door. A new life is knocking on your heart's door. Today's year, the restoration is knocking on your heart's door. Peace is knocking on your heart's door. Joy is knocking on your heart's door. Meaning is knocking on your heart's door. Purpose is knocking on your heart's door. Forgiveness is knocking on your heart's door. You could open. Who is it? And God said, it's love. Open up. But you know who I am and what I've done? Because I don't care about that. I died for all of that. I just want to forgive you. I want to give you wholeness. I want to give you peace. I know you've been looking for it. It just hurts me to see the misery and pain that you're in. Will you allow me to heal you? I'm going to count to three. If you're saying, Pastor, I've heard God's message tonight. And this is a simple, simple message. The Bible. In Romans 6.23 says, for the wage of sin is death. That means that sin produces misery, pain, separation from God and all his blessings. And at the end, if we refuse to accept Jesus and his forgiveness and his new life, it will lead not only to misery today, but misery for eternity. It could happen. I love your kids. I love you. I love your sons and your daughters. They need to hear. God loves them. And all he wants is for them to be with him forever. He just wants to be their father. A loving, kind father. And whatever sin that you're dealing with, I want you to get this. You could be forgiven, number one. You could be set free, number two. And a miracle could happen. You could have a new heart with new desires. It could happen. That's how the drug addict comes, and that's how the alcoholic comes, and that's how the adulterer comes, and that's how the person that's been stuck in pornography comes. You don't fix your life and come to God. You come to God with your wrong desires. And just admit they're wrong, and God will forgive you, and he'll make you a brand new person. It can happen today. You just say, God, forgive me, and he'll give you, forgive you, and he'll give you eternal life. Now, the way just sin is death. What happened? God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for your sins. Like I told you, the sin 
It must be paid for. My daughter driving in the carpool lane, it's got to be paid for. It's not going away. But daddy's going to pay for it so she can go free. But if I don't pay for it, she can't go free. Her car eventually will be impounded and the consequences will go higher. And all I'm saying is God loves you so much that you owed a price you couldn't pay. And God sent his son to die for your sins so that your, the price is paid. All you have to do is accept it and say, thank you, Daddy, for sending your son as a human being to pay the price for all the wrong that I've done. Forgive me. Set me free. And God will forgive you. And not only set you free, he'll clear your record and give you eternal life. Fullness of life. Jesus is knocking your heart's door. Will you let him in? I'm going to count to three saying, Pastor, that's me. I want a new life today. I want forgiveness. I want the fullness of life that you talked about. I want to be like that lady at the well that was thirsty and searching and she couldn't find the relationship, but she found it in, a, in an encounter with Jesus. One encounter changed her life forever. It gave her purpose. It gave her meaning. Today's your day. When I say three, say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be forgiven. Come the way you are. I want to be set free. I want a new heart. I want a new beginning. I want you to raise your hand. Or I need to recommit my life to the Lord. One, two, three. Raise your hands all this building. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to start over. I want to surrender everything to God. I want those to raise their hands. Come forward real quick. Come on. Just come forward. Come come forward. Ask your neighbor. You want to go up there? I'll go up there with you. Come on. Let's give the Lord a hand. I know we went a little over today. But come on. It's worth it for our soul. Come on. It's worth it for our soul. Come on. Let's give the Lord a hand. Come on. Someone's giving their life to Jesus. Come the way you are. God will forgive you. He'll give you a new life. Come on, he's not here to judge you. He's here to save you. He's here to give you the fullness of life you're looking for. Come on, today's the day. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Come on, someone needs to recommit their life to the Lord. Today's your day. Come on, if you're struggling, even with homosexuality, come on, today's your day. Come to Jesus the way you are. God wants to forgive you and give you a new life and give you a new heart. It can happen today. These scriptures are not to judge us, but they're to warn us. Be careful. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Today's your day. Come on, they're still coming. I want to make sure we don't miss anybody. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Everybody that came up today to surrender their life to Jesus, you want prayer? We're going to pray right now, okay? Jesus could come back anytime. We're in those days. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I know that I've sinned against you. I've been on the wrong path. And your word says, the wage of sin is death and I know that I should have been punished but you love me so much you sent your son to die and be punished in my place so that I can receive forgiveness love freedom and eternal life make me a new person fill my heart with your love. Thank you, Jesus. Heal my mind. Heal my family. Make me new. In the name of Jesus, I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. Church, we love you. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Next week we'll do part two. We're going deeper on this subject. God bless you. We love you guys. End times. Are we in the end times? I think we are. God bless you. Any prayer? Come on up here. I'll be.